here we go. Hello there. Thanks for joining me. I am Dr. Jen, and I'm so excited for you educating yourself by listening to my life as a landlord. My guest today has an incredible skill set. Wait until you hear about him and his love of learning. He's also a real estate investor, but his business model is different than most of what you have heard of. Most investors buy distressed houses under market, fix them up, put a tenant in them, sometimes with a property manager, and then refinance it or sell it. But my guest today is a turnkey investor and one heck of an intellect. Uh, here to tell us about his former NASA consulting and real estate, Dr. Scott Stanfield. Welcome, Scott. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. And the funny thing, we were just chuckling right before we started recording that you don't go by Dr. Stanfield. Oh. <laughs> I, all, the only place that I go by Dr. Jen is in this podcast. Otherwise, in my real life, nobody calls me that. <laughs> yep, they call me Scott. <laughs> they call, right. They call me Jen. Exactly. <laughs> now, where are you uh, at today? Where are you calling from? Yeah, so I'm, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio right now. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I am in rainy British Columbia, known as uh, a, a spot in the upper Sunshine Coast, but today it's liquid sunshine. It is absolutely pouring rain here. So here we are. What are we doing on a rainy day? We're recording podcasts about real estate. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, let's talk about fun stuff. Let's talk about school. You've got a PhD in engineering. Tell us about your, your doctorate. I love it. Yeah, sure. So I... I started the PhD program at Wright State University. This is in Dayton, Ohio. It's, it's right by the Air Force Research Laboratory there at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And I did a lot of atomic molecular spectroscopy for plasma discharges. I was looking at dielectric barrier discharges and just trying to understand the physics. Uh, and, and the application, well, I should say there's a lot of applications, but the one that we were interested in was actually just controlling the flows around uh, just different vehicles or wings, things like that for the Air Force. So that's that's how I got started. And it was it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. A lot of just learning. I had a great uh, several mentors, uh, including including my advisor, which is uh, James Menard. But uh, so that that's how I got started professionally. And it, like I said, it was it was pretty good. And then, of course, Afterwards, I worked as a contractor for the Air Force. Uh, I got to work on all kinds of just neat projects. And then um, I started working for another company called ISSI. So I was still working for Air Force projects, but then also I got to work on projects for the Na you know, for NASA, for the Navy, uh, Army. So a lot of just really interesting people, smart people. That's, that's what I got to do and meet them, work on their projects. And it was, it was a lot of fun. So. Scott, you're so, you're so humble and you're so, I, I, you're so intellectual and just, you used a lot of $10 words, right? When you started dielectric <laughs> stop. And I just, I just, uh, I know that you're, you're way more analytical than I am. And that's what has led you into real estate investing, but Tell us how you got into real estate investing from all your NASA, U.S. Air Force, your consulting stuff, your engineering, all the stuff that you had started. How on earth did that lead you to real estate investing? <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess the path might look a little blurry, but really, I had not made any money up until I graduated college. And so I, I never thought about, well, what am I going to invest in? I didn't have anything to invest. <laughs> uh, you know, when you when you go to college, you you really just don't have money until you start working. And so, after I started working, I was able to save money and I had money there. And I was like, well, I I know I'm supposed to invest this. But what do I want to invest in? I really didn't have a at that time much understanding of stocks and whatnot. But I had a pretty good feel for how real estate worked. You know, I mean, I, I had been a renter <laughs> up to that point. And so that's when I started looking at real estate as a way to just you know, begin investing my money. And so that's how I got started. And I, I did go more of the traditional path. You know, you, you read a lot and everybody's like, oh, well, you got to find this house that's distressed or or whatnot, and then do this work and try to, um, you know, manage it or flip it or, or however you want to exit from it. And so I I did that path. I, I started networking with agents and I had some agents show me these 
really nice luxury condos in downtown Cincinnati. And so that's actually how I got started. I bought those and I self-managed them. And I learned very quickly that it was it was a huge time sink. <laughs> it did not fit with my schedule. And so that's that's actually when I started to go a different mm -hmm. path with real estate. So okay. that's how I got started. And then that's when I, I really looked at, at turnkey. <laughs> it was right. much better for my my schedule. Fair enough. Well, I, I think there's a lot of listeners out there who are uh, either educating themselves or just getting started and, and still educating themselves. And so their, their experience in real estate could vary very wildly, right? We've got, you know, very experienced seasoned landlords that listen to the podcast that is just fantastic that know 98% of what we say, but they're looking for that nugget. And then you've got other folks who aren't necessarily as experienced in landlording, in real estate investing. And so as a result, what happens is you get into this, this idea, this philosophy of you've got to buy a distressed house under market or property, maybe not a house, property. And it's, why is that? It's because that's what we're taught and because mm -hmm. people have minimal or no money and, or, you know, unsure. And um, part of that involves time. You know, if you don't know what your holding time is, or you're making a big assumption on your holding time, then it, it can really disrupt your whole philosophy. But I love what you're talking about is turnkey. Now, so you've got a bit of money, you made some investments. Tell right. us what your, your model of turnkey is, because it's very different than what most of the real estate investors that are starting out are taught. So please tell us what it's all about. So I, probably the best way to think about it is just looking at what a turnkey provider does. So a turnkey provider is a company where they are looking for those distressed properties and they are going to do renovation work on those properties and bring them up to the rental standards of that neighborhood. And then of course, they're going to you know find tenant, place a tenant, and then they have in-house property management and they're going to start managing those properties for you. Uh, and so that that's what a turnkey provider does. So as a, a turnkey investor, what I'm doing is looking at these different providers. I'm looking at how they do their renovations, where they're selecting properties at, what are the financial numbers. And I'm stepping in really after a lot of the hard part, which is marketing for these distressed properties, um, you know, finding good, reliable contractors who can do this work for you to, to bring it up to rent ready. He said, I'm stepping in after that. I'm actually essentially outsourcing that entire process with just one purchase. And you give up a little bit, right? It's not potentially something you're going to immediately buy, renovate, put a tenant in, and then refinance out you know, a big chunk of your capital. However, if you look at returns on a turnkey property, at least the ones that I target, it's between about 20 and 35% annualized. Now that's looking at appreciation. Uh, that's of course a leveraged return, right? You're buying with a down payment and that's cash flow. And then of course the balance of your mortgage as it goes down. But for me, that was plenty good enough. And I was able to build a portfolio that way and expand it to many houses. And you know my returns have been excellent. And so at this point, you know, my portfolio, it, it performs very, very well. And of course it was assembled in a way that was not traditional. <laughs> no, so. not true. Well, and that's, what's really fun about you and I talking today is that it isn't traditional. You know, Mike and I've done so many education programs on real estate investing, you know, um, just both in multifamily and in single family homes. And it's all the same, find something that's under market that hasn't been repositioned yet and do the work stabilize it and then either sell it or refinance. But I love that your turnkey, uh, your turnkey business model is all about the exit strategy for everybody else. Yes. Do you have a lot of choices <laughs> then? Exit. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And there are a lot of options. So yeah. What do you like to buy? Do you like to buy single family homes or you like to buy multifamily or do you mix it? Um, so I haven't been mixing it. I have looked at multifamily, but if you were to look at the price per door on multifamily in the mm -hmm. last say six, seven, eight years, it's been very, very high to a point where it just, for me, it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I've been focusing on single family uh, and 
realize too that what I'm doing is I'm just looking at what the market gives us, right? So if the market's showing us that single family is a really good asset class and that I should be investing there, then that's where I invest. It's it's that simple. And so okay. my portfolio is it's single family homes and that's what I've been doing. Now I have looked at duplexes and I've looked at, you know, much larger multifamily uh properties, but just none of them have made sense. And so I've just stuck right. where I can make money. <laughs> so you've got, you've obviously, you know, with your intellect, uh, mm -hmm. Scott, I, I know that you've got your key positioning indicators, your KPIs. I know that you've got some different rules of thumb. And so price per door, mm -hmm. um, what other KPIs do you use? Price per square foot? I mean, is there, what other rules of so thumb do you use? For me, I really target cash flow. Cash flow okay. is, for me is king. And I know that if, I, if I'm buying property in a good location, I will hit those national averages for appreciation rates, right? So for single family homes, that's 3.8% nationally in the US. Mm -hmm. So so long as I have cash flow and I'm buying where people wanna live, the rest take care of itself. Now I still look at the rest, right? But the, that's really the key. It's, it's really all about cash flow. And then of course, I also look at the property itself. I want it to be something that's going to cater to your average homeowner or your average renter, because I want to make, well, obviously I'm, I have, my product is housing, right? So I really want to be able to cater to a majority. And so a lot of the economic indicators that I look at are really geared around that. And of course, it's all really about finding good markets for cash flow purposes. And well, so that, that's what I really focus on because that, that's where you hedge your risk, right? If your cash flow is too low and your margins are thin that way, it doesn't matter if it appreciates 20% every year. If you couldn't sell it because of a market downturn and you don't have cash flow coming in, you're still at risk. Right. So for me, cash flow is really the where it's at. And that, that's, that's the KPI. My focus. Okay. Well, let's talk um, locations. You'd mentioned locations multiple times, whether it's um, local locations or geographic or in the vicinity of Amazon or Google or Tesla right. or whatever, the employers that are going to employ the, your future tenants, mm -hmm. where geographically do you like to invest? Yeah. So I, I would, first I start off by just looking at all the, the major metropolitan areas. And then I, I have different indicators to tell me which ones that I want to, to really mm -hmm. be in. And of course for that, it's more about population growth. It's sure. not, it's really not that difficult. It makes sense that you want to go where people are moving. Uh, and of course, so that that's how I begin selecting. But you know, once I I'm selecting that way, and I have specific neighborhoods in mind, uh, or I should say, certain or specific metropolitans in mind. Well, now I am thinking about well, who who are the people that are going to rent this, right? right? And if it's a family, like for example, if it's a neighborhood geared towards families, which I do like, then I am going to pay attention to schools. I do want to be in mm -hmm. neighborhoods that are, um, you know, conducive to families. And so I do want to see properties that have at least three bedrooms or, or four mm -hmm. bedrooms, right? Two full bathrooms. <laughs> you yeah. Have, don't want only one full bathroom. No. Right. So th that that's really what what I look at. I'm I'm really focused on who is the renter and what do they need and does this property offer that? Uh, in general, I tend to steer towards more for families. I, I like the three, four bedroom model. Um Okay. The average length of stay for a tenant in that model is about five and a half years. Uh, so that's that's why <laughs> I don't want to have turnover. Turnover is very expensive. So which I know. Absolutely. You <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> agree. Um, turnover is very expensive. And I've got unfor unfortunately right now I've got three vacancies and which wow. is astounding to us. Um, but we've got a large multifamily complex of almost 200 units coming online. Okay. And so the, the local market is getting a shakeup mm -hmm. and we knew this was going to happen. And so we just sort of had to hedge our bet and go, you know what, we need to just keep going and being realistic about supply and demand. And is our price point right? Are we marketing it right? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Scott, with all of your different, your perfect tenants and your ideal employers and your ideal neighborhoods, right. what's your take on pets? Animals are a real touchy subject. What's your take? I actually don't mind pets. Um, I, Good. I, they're not hard on. I don't mind them either. <laughs> no, and the thing is, is that you you have a pet deposit. Some people will charge more rent, that sort. 
I find pets are, are, if a property is destroyed, it's not because of a pet ever, never. <laughs> it's never because of a pet. And so I, I really don't have a problem with pets at all. So. I, I find that people that have, especially dogs, I mean, I, we've had, a, we had a big dog for a long time, my, my boy Mac. And we found that people who had dogs in general, maybe not just big dogs, were mm -hmm. more responsible. Why? Because you have to walk the dog. Right. You've got to clean up the poo. Mm -hmm. You've got to really be mindful. Otherwise, the lawnmower isn't going to walk through all the poo. And no. so, you know, but but we have an, a bit of an issue with outdoor cats. Mm -hmm. um, outdoor cats are a bit of an issue for us. And the reason why is because the cats are all running around and they're crapping all over the yard. Nobody yeah. cleans it up. And so that, you know, that's our take. And I know um, for my Canadian listeners, uh, emotional support animals aren't so much of a thing in the US, definitely um, emotional support animals, you know, um, and service animals for sure. I mean, service animals are, are sort of a universal thing, but emotional support animals are different. Um, I just find that animals in general are really a touchy subject. So that the fact that you uh, allow pets is, uh, great i think oh, I yeah think. no I, I like i said pets are absolutely fine i, I like right? that yeah. yeah no i i agree with you that if the house is going to have damage chances are likely especially the chances are likely that it's not because of the pets uh right. especially we limit uh we don't allow dogs less than 12 months old mm -hmm. and they've got to be fixed for us we're not doing you know breeding that's not okay for us. Yeah, no, no, uh, you're, you're right? not business out of <laughs> out of my rental. No, no, no. Right. So anyway, I just wanted your to get your take on that. So let's zoom out a second, though, Scott. Um, you've got your rental portfolio, your real estate portfolio, your turnkey business model. Mm -hmm. But I'm betting you're such an intellect. I'm betting that real estate is not your only investment. Uh, Am I right? You're very, very, very right. Yeah, no, I, I have multiple investments. I have my hands in a lot of stuff. I tend to get interested in something very easily. And then once I'm interested, I, I really just plow into it. And so I am involved in option trading, for example. I write algorithms that trade options. I really enjoy that. I find that challenging. Of course you do. And rewarding. <laughs> Uh, it makes me it probably in the minority, but yeah, I, I'm involved in that. I like stocks, uh, you know, really just anything. I, and I'll look at any investment vehicle. And so, I mean, really, sure. I wrote a book. If you think about it in terms of a, an investment, that that's what it is. Although that, that wasn't why I wrote it, but it's still, again, it still can be thought of as an investment. And so I, I have my hands on a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, let's let's is, talk about your books. So for those sure, of you who sure. are at YouTube at My Life as a Landlord watching, thank you. I've got my book, I've got Scott's book in my hand called Passive Profits, The Turnkey Rental Investor's Guide. And Scott, you and I have talked at length about passive investing and what yes. that actually means to different people. I mean, the name of your book is Passive Profits. Yes. Is real estate passive investment? No, no, but <laughs> you can make it as passive as you want, but the reality is you will always be involved. You will be involved in, in some capacity. And yeah, you know, sure, I, I step in towards the back end, which is other people's exit strategies. But going forward, after I make a purchase, yeah, I spend a lot of time still monitoring the asset. You, you just, you have to. And right. I spend less time than most people, which is why I call it passive. You know, I, I do spend about two hours a month where I, I'm going over all the financial statements. I'm reconciling my account, making sure everything ties. And if something doesn't, I'm on the phone. I need to talk to the manager. I got to figure out exactly what's going on. If there's a problem and they, you know, they'll be calling me and we'll be discussing it. If there's a, a work order that needs to be done on something quite expensive and maybe they're uh, their quotes really high. I'm going to ask them for another quote or multiple quotes to sure. again hedge my bets on whether or not they're really doing what they're supposed to. So, you know, it's never truly passive. That's just the nature of things. And you might think, well, okay, so dividends that's passive. No, you, you still need to monitor the performance of the companies that you're invested in. And if a certain industry is really struggling, you know, the right choice might be to sell 
and move your 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 investment capital into a different dividend paying stock. That's you know, so you're you're never going to find something that is 100% truly passive. Now, I do think you can find activities that make really good money and you spend very little amount of time on and that and that's why I call this passive profits. If you look at my hourly rate, it's through the roof. Right? I I make more money per hour doing this than I can do <laughs> almost anything. That and sounded so very American, uh, by the way. Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> the but roof. I, yeah, but I, I think there's a there's value in that too, right? If you really right. use it to organize which activities you want to get into, you know, the of ones course. that are going to pay the most per hour. It it's 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 a way to try, right? There's other stuff too. You it has to fit you. <laughs> so, of course, of course. Yeah, so that that's how I view passive, and when you when you do invest in turnkey, it is more passive than a lot of other activities, more suitable to somebody that is a busy professional or, you know, or whatnot. So that's sure. That's how I define it. That's how I look at it. So that's awesome. So while I've got you on the podcast, I'm, I can't, I can't not ask you because I know how your brain works. Like you're way more analytical than me, which I admire, by the way, I am just sort of in awe of all the things that you talk about. I know you haven't mentioned even a fraction of them here. (laughs) <laughs> but I, I, I'm excited because talking with you, knowing that we have, there's a Canadian election later this year, yes. there's an American election later this year. How are you going to posture yourself knowing all of these major events are going to happen that are going to affect the global economy? How is Scott Stanfield posturing himself? Yes. Very simple. I'm watching and I'm not doing anything major. Oh, you're not doing anything. You're sitting out. Okay. <laughs> really very happy. So, and realize it depends on where you're at with your portfolio and how your portfolio portfolio is performing. I am very happy. And I'm talking just strictly real estate. Sure. Uh, obviously, I some of the other stuff I do, like the day trading and option trading, that that's very different. But with real estate, I the last house I bought was actually January of 2022. I could have still bought more and there were properties that would have met my criteria, but I felt that we were already going into hyper supply phase, mm-hmm. the market cycle. And for me, when I have a portfolio, I'm actually getting into that stage of the cycle, I change gears. I, I'm not looking to expand. I'm actually looking to start to deleverage. I'm looking to lower my loan to debt ratio. And I've been able to do that. I'm now down below 50%, which is fantastic. And and for me, that hedges against the uncertainty of how this election will go. And so I was already doing that a few years ago and it stopped buying and and that was at the height of the market. And those last properties I bought, they were two new bills in Alabama. I've done very well. I, you know, I have about the houses are about fifty, sixty thousand dollars more than I paid for. That's how much they're worth. They're sure. producing fantastic cash flow, about six hundred dollars a month after fixed expenses. So I still may have some, uh, you know, maintenance and stuff, but very little from those properties are being managed very well. And so my portfolio is performing perfectly. I, I, it's as close to perfect as I can. I don't want to make any changes right now. I'm more happy to just wait and see and when i get the green light again that is we start (laughs) out of the recession they resolve some of these big issues right yeah and we enter an expansion phase that's when i'll start to be a little more aggressive that's when i may start to refinance some of the capital out again and maybe you know start to broaden and buy buy more property but for now i'm in a great spot i have a great hedge against inflation because i do have loans low interest rates uh, my debt isn't so much that it's stifling. Right? I have good cash flow. Um, ha- I, most of my properties are under two-year leases. Mm-hmm. I can just ride through whatever's going to happen with uh, the election, and, and that—that's really where I want to be at for this election. Perfect. You know that government policy and how it's going to affect uh, your investments, and and it's it's a huge player. So <clears throat> yeah, for me, that's that's key. No, I appreciate it. And, and your your answer makes perfect sense. I was hoping that you were going to say something more intellectual or you're going to have an algorithm and like no. the perfect criteria. <laughs> and No, you're just going to wait. Okay, fine. Chase the perfect criteria. You will never find it. Uh, no, it's, it's, wise yeah. words. But 
you, doesn't mean you shouldn't still look, <laughs> right? Fair you know, enough. You in looking, you'll start to understand how uh, interest rates affect rents and more, you know, and all that sort. And and that there's a lot of value, right? That that's just broadening your understanding of all the different dependent variables, and and there's a lot of uh, value to that. For sure. No, that's perfect. Wow. Amazing, Scott. So happy to have you on the show today. If uh, if a listener wants to uh, get a hold of you, how do they do that? If they want to buy your book, how do they do that? Oh, yeah. So um, to get a hold of me, it's really easy. Just if you go to my website, I have an email address there for me and you can learn more about me there. Um, you can reach out through email. If you email me, I always respond. Uh, sure. And so if you have questions, you're trying to get started, or maybe you're further in this process and you just, you know, have questions about that, then, you know, feel free to reach out to me. And I don't have all the answers, but I can point you in the right direction. I can give you my thoughts on something. And, you know, I, like I said, I, I like that. So I want people to actually interact with me. Uh, as Love far it. as the book goes, it's, it's on Amazon. Uh, so it's pretty easy to find. It's also on my website. Um, and so, you know, you can pick it up wherever. Perfect. So it's got your website. Let me make sure I got this. It's Scott A stanfield.com right so yes, yes. i should have said o t t a and then s t a n f i e l d scott a stanfield.com and that's got your email your contact info you can check out the book um if you're a us uh recipient i think you have free delivery oh yeah mm -hmm. us residents only i tried to buy one up into canada and i had to end up uh buying it on amazon uh, okay. dot ca and so i had to pay for shipping and so um anyway yeah. so you can save five bucks if you want to buy his book save five bucks buy it off the website um but great i'm so happy to have you on the show today scott um any parting thoughts um well i guess just you know for people who want to invest it's worth doing so really you know look into it, it can change your life that's that i think it's really the biggest takeaway from this don't go down the mainstream if you don't have to and or if you have something special, you know, figure out what works for you and, and take action. It really it. helps. So awesome. Well, thanks for being on the show today. So Thank happy to have you. Thank you. Excellent.